Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for another episode of Mysterious Tales from the Land Down Under. This tale is a little like the movie Speed with a twist of Reservoir Dogs, Mr. Brown and the Qantas Flight 755. Was it a hoax or was it the real thing? Just call me Mr. Brown, said the man who telephoned Qantas house in Sydney on the 26th of May 1971. He said that there was a bomb aboard Flight 755 from Sydney to Hong Kong. If he was not given half a million dollars, it would explode as the plane and its nearly 130 passengers and crew landed. The caller had left a duplicate bomb in a locker at Mascot, Sydney Airport as proof that he was serious. He was. When police opened locker 84, they found a gelignite bomb connected to an aldermeter and several notes, one saying that the plane would explode if it flew below 20,000 feet, 6,000 meters. The bomb in the locker was disarmed, the gel ignite was replaced with a light bulb and the disarmed device rushed to another plane to confirm the exact altitude at which it would detonate. It turned out to be 5,000 feet. Aboard Flight 755, Captain William Selwyn, then over Dolby in Queensland, was told to keep his plane at 20,000 feet and divert to Brisbane. Crew began searching the aircraft, telling the passengers only that there was a technical problem. Brisbane Airport refused to take the Boeing, so Selwyn was directed back to Sydney, flying as slowly as possible, while authorities on the ground negotiated with Mr Brown. Circling over the sea, Selwyn radioed that he would need to land no later than 7 p.m. It was not until 5.45 p.m. that Captain R.J. Ritchie of Qantas emerged from Qantas House carrying two large suitcases. He went towards a yellow combi van waiting outside the building in Chifley Square and pushed the suitcases into the vehicle, as directed. Police were watching, but for some reason were unable to follow the van and Mr Brown got clean away with half a million dollars. But Captain Selwyn with his plane load of people was still circling Mascot increasingly anxious about the fuel level. In the air and on the ground everyone waited. Television news had picked up the story and as the minutes ticked by the nation was transfixed. At last Mr. Brown called to say, there is no bomb aboard the plane. You can land her safely. Selwyn had 16 minutes of flying time left when he finally brought flight 755 to a safe landing. Attention now turned to tracking the mysterious Mr. Brown. Police forces at home and abroad swung into action. A $50,000 reward was offered and an identity kit face was created. Police even came up with a plastic replica of a bespeckled and moustached man looking disturbingly like Dole Barbie's male friend Ken. It was not until some months later that Mr Brown's accomplice, Raymond Pointing, began driving around in newly acquired luxury cars that the hunt ended. Suspicions were raised and reported. The police followed up with some surveillance and arresting Ponting, who quickly confessed. But where was Mr Brown and who was he? Following Pointing's information, it wasn't long before police tracked down the elusive extortionist. He turned out to be a British migrant named Peter Macari. Charged together with Pointing, Macari claimed that there was a mysterious mastermind behind the crime and that he was only a dupe. He had given over $200,000 of the ransom to this man he called Ken. Nobody believed him, including the judge, who gave him 15 years and pointing seven. Police had by then recovered just over half of the booty, secreted in various suburban locations around inner Sydney, but the rest is still missing. Local law has it that the money is lying in a couple of metal containers or safes somewhere off Bondi Beach. Macari was released from prison after serving eight years and deported aboard a Qantas flight to his homeland in the United Kingdom. He and his audacious crime were the subject of a 1985 movie and folk parody 
that plays the hoax for laughs. The Qantas extortion was not the only Mr. Brown mystery. Macario was using an alias, William Day, while enjoying a high living his loot allowed. William, or Billy, Day vanished in Queensland in 1970 while visiting the state together with Macari. Almost a quarter of a century after Day's disappearance, New South Wales Police interviewed Peter Macari, then running a fish and chip shop in Brighton, England. He claimed to know nothing about Billy Day, saying he'd simply plucked the name out of the air. But there were several witnesses who remembered the two men living together in Australia. The police formed a view that Macari probably murdered Day and stole his identity. It seems that there was not enough evidence to take the case any further. But there was still one more twist in this extraordinary tale. Macari may also have murdered his own brother, George Macari, who went missing in England in 1962. It was five years before they found the body, but the case remained open. British police reviewed this murder in 2017 and nominated Peter Macari as the most likely killer. But by then, Peter Macari, alias Mr. Brown, alias William Day, had been dead for four years, taking his secrets with him to the grave. This is yet another crazy tale. A bomb hoax and unsolved murders? Well, what more could you ask for? And it is said that Peter got the idea of the bomb hoax from a movie he saw back in Queensland, Rod Serling's Doomsday Flight. This movie is also said to have been indirectly responsible for six others who have tried to hijack planes and bomb hoaxes and such. Poor Rod Serling. He only came up with a story he thought would make a great movie, but... You know what people are like, there's a lot of nutters out there. Rod has said that he regrets making the movie and he wishes he'd never been born. So many people and lives have been touched after watching his movie. When you think about it, it's not really his fault. I mean, how many nutters are out there trying to recreate all these murders and things that they watch on TV? I think we've just got to look at it as people are crazy and crazies will do anything. Sometimes for fame sometimes for fortune, and sometimes because they're absolute nutters. And no film director can really be blamed for insane people out there, can they? Otherwise, we wouldn't have the great movies and action films, special effects that we have today if every director thought, oh, maybe there's somebody that might go and kill someone if I do a horror movie. You know, it's just insane. But we hope you enjoyed this insane tale, and we've got plenty more to come. So definitely like, subscribe, and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so you're aware when we're posting more mysterious tales from the land down under. In an isolated township of 11 people, one man goes missing, and then there were 10. Did he have an accident in the endless emptiness? Or was it a more sinister occurrence? Not too many suspects for police to interview should be an open and shut case. As every Arthur Conan Doyle reader knows, the suave criminal mastermind Professor Moriarty was Sherlock Holmes' archenemy, and Paddy Moriarty, by contrast, was a knockabout bush character who disappeared from the Northern Territory hamlet of Larimar without trace or reason. The vanishing of 70-year-old Paddy Moriarty and his Kelpie Kelly is a case so puzzling that even the great fictional detective would be hard-pressed to solve it. On the 16th of December 2017, Moriarty and Kelly finished up their regular afternoon session at the Pink Panther Hotel and headed home to Paddy's place on his quad bike. They never came back. Next day, Barry Sharp, the publican, and Paddy's mate went to find out what had happened. Paddy's reading glasses and hats were all in his home together with the remains of some chicken given to him by a passing tourist. Everything was perfectly normal, but Paddy and Kelly were not there. Paddy had still not turned up the next day, and on the 19th, Barry reported the disappearance. 
Laramar is on the Stewart Highway, more than 400 kilometres southeast of Darwin, and several hours from the nearest police station. When police arrived, the locals were already out searching the scrub. The search was expanded with police and emergency services personnel in air support. They looked in searing heat until sunset on the 23rd of December. Nothing. It was looking as if Highway of Death, notorious for unexplained disappearances, had claimed another victim. Paddy was known to be under treatment for a heart condition and it was feared he might have had an accident and without his medication perished. But what about Kelly? And why would he leave his hat at home if he went for a walk in the December heat? Checks on Paddy's bank showed he had not accessed his account since his disappearance. It didn't add up. By the time detectives came onto the case, Paddy had been missing for days, further complicating an already perplexing situation. But the police were sure of one thing. Paddy had not met with an accident, nor had he been consumed by the crocodile known as Sneaky Sam, an attraction at the wildlife menagerie kept behind the Pink Panther for the amusement of tourists. The police checked. Someone, or some ones, had murdered Paddy Moriarty. A second, more focused search after Christmas failed to find any relevant in the local tip, in dams, in any sinkholes, or among the ruins of World War II Army staging camp nearby. Suspicion fell upon the remaining residents of Larimar. The tiny community rubbed along most of the time, it seems, but there were tensions. The otherwise jovial Paddy had an intense dislike of Fran Hodgkitts, who owned the Devonshire Tea House opposite his home. Her pies were famous, but Paddy was extremely vocal in expressing his dislike of them. Barry's pub also began to sell pies which Paddy promoted with his provocative sign directing customers away from the tea house and towards the Pink Panther where he worked as well as drank. The feud intensified. At various times dead ruse had appeared beneath Fran's bedroom window and there was no love lost between the two. While admitting that her relationship with Paddy was toxic, Fran denied any wrongdoing. Paddy could be argumentative, as she was not his only enemy in the settlement. The police investigated all the possible angles and have found no evidence against her or against anyone else. Since Paddy's vanishing, Larimar has begun to change. Some have left. Barry Sharp died in 2019. The local Wubalamun people have won their native title claim including a one square kilometre section of the township where Paddy's house is situated. They intend to build homes for their people with a view to the future running of Larimar. The quirky character of this mystery has attracted worldwide attention. It has been the subject of articles and documentaries and also featured in books of unsolved crimes. An award-winning podcast and a tenacious detective who has vowed never to give up on the case have also helped to keep the story in the public eye. It's a very likely to remain there also. In early 2021, the Northern Territory Police offered a $250,000 reward that may yet lead to Paddy Moriarty being found. I'm sure I'm not the only one who suspects that Paddy ended up in one of those pies. It has been done before, a horrific way to get rid of someone you don't like or where their body's taken far away, out of the area. Once again, if someone's going to take someone out, murder them. Don't murder their pet, please. <laughs> we here at Haunted and Historic Australia are very pet friendly. Despite all that, like all unsolved cases and missing people, we do hope that Paddy's found safe and sound, and Kelly too.
Join us next time for another mysterious tale from the land down under. A $250,000 reward has now been offered for information in relation to the death of Paddy Moriarty. Paddy was last seen at dusk on the 16th of December 2017 after he left the Larimer Hotel on his quad bike with his dog Kelly. They have not been seen since. Pick up the phone. We want to hear from you. You may be eligible for immunity from prosecution. Paddy was 70 years of age when he disappeared. He was 168 centimetres tall with black and grey hair, wearing a white singlet, dark shorts, brown thongs and a dark cap. We have a photo of Paddy taken at the Larimer Hotel on the day he went missing, which shows what he was wearing. Kelly was a young female Red Kelpie. The investigation remains focused on establishing what happened to Paddy, where he might be and who is responsible for his murder. It is a mystery. We all want to know what happened to Paddy and Kelly. This reward will help spark conversations about what happened. Any person with information regarding the disappearance of Paddy is asked to call NT Police on 131444 or Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Someone out there has information about what happened to Paddy and we want them to come forward. Further searches for Paddy will continue for as long as it takes.